Hi everyone. In this lesson, we're going to discuss the minima section of an instrument approach chart. Now the minima section consists of three separate areas. First, you have the category, which indicates what approach speed your aircraft is going to be flying. Category A is for small, slower aircraft flying approaches under 90 knots. As your approach speed increases, so does the category. Category D aircraft are normally high-performance jet aircraft with the fastest approach speeds. Next, you have the category of approach. You have straight-in approaches, which have an S next to them, or you can have circling approaches, which indicate that you'll be making the approach for one runway, however executing the circling procedure to land on the opposite or a different runway at the airport. Finally, you have your decision heights or minimum descent altitudes and minimum visibility for the approach. Now let's look at these sections in detail. Now like we've already said, the category data is specific to your aircraft and your approach speed being flown. The category of approach is specific to the type of approach plate that you're looking at. An ILS approach will always have the straight in ILS value. If you can fly the localizer, it'll always have the localizer value. And if there's a circling approach, it will always have the circling value. We'll look at a few different types of approach plates later, but this is the basic type of approach. Next, we have the minimum descent height or descent altitude data and the minimum visibility required for the approach. We can always look directly to the right of type, the type of approach to find the minimums for that approach. In this case, for the straight in ILS to runway 10 right, your minimum decision height is 480 feet. What this means is that you cannot descend below 480 feet unless you have any required item in sight, such as runway lights the runway environment, approach lights, etc. At 480 feet, if you don't have the runway environment or any other required item in sight, you must execute a missed approach. Next, you have the minimum visibility data. In this case, it's 2400 feet RVR, runway visual range, or one half statute mile, which is the equivalent. Most ATISs will report in statute miles instead of RVR, unless the airport feels necessary to use RVR values due to deteriorating visibility. Now the visibility value is the only controlling value that determines whether you can actually execute the approach or not. If the reported visibility is below the minimum visibility value listed on the approach chart, you are not allowed to start the approach. If so visibility is above the minimum value, you are allowed to fly the approach. None of the other ceilings are controlling only the visibility when it comes to flying an approach. The next number, in this case the 287, indicates the height above touchdown when you get to the decision height of 480 feet. So once you're at 480 feet, you're actually 287 feet above the actual touchdown zone. Finally, we come to the AGL value of the decision height. Now the 480 feet of the decision height is actually read on the altimeter. It's a barometric altitude. The 300 feet is rounded to the nearest even number and it's an AGL value for that decision height. So 300 feet and a half mile. That means that if you look at the weather report and the clouds are below 300 feet, you know that you don't have a very good prob probability of breaking out and landing. However, if the clouds are above 300 feet, you know that you probably will break out and be able to land. Next, let's look at the, lo the uh, localizer minimums. They're just a little bit different. 
First things first, you can see that the localizer is broken into two sections, one for category A and B, and one for category C and D. This is because the faster aircraft have less reaction time while flying the approach, and therefore need just a little bit more visibility to safely execute the landing. Now, the first number that you're going to come to in this case is 900 feet. 900 feet on a non-precision approach is your minimum descent altitude. It is the lowest that you can go on that approach. However, it's not a decision height. What that means is that you may descend to 900 feet and fly level at 900 feet until your missed approach point the missed approach point, then you must go missed. Next, you have 2400 feet RVR, which again is one half statute mile. Again, that's the only controlling item on this entire chart for whether you can or cannot fly the approach. Next is 707 feet above the touchdown zone and the AGL value of 700 and one half that corresponds. Now, let's take a look at the circling minima. Circling always requires a little more visibility and usually higher ceilings due to the fact that you actually have to fly a traffic pattern around the airport and land. In this case, the circling MDA is actually still 900 feet. However, the visibility has increased to one statute mile. So now when you listen to the ATIS or weather, the visibility has to be one mile or greater in order for you to execute the circling approach. Now, we have a different value of 643 feet. 643 feet is the height above airport. On the previous two straight ends, that was the height above the touchdown zone elevation and now we have the height above the airport elevation. This is also because you are flying the traffic pattern. So it brings you down to the specific height above the actual airport. Now, your AGL data will still be the same since you're coming to 900 feet and you still are 700 feet above the ground, rounded to the nearest 100 and one mile of visibility. One thing to note with categories C and D is you can see how much the visibility requirements increase. For category C aircraft, you need to add an extra mile of visibility to fly the localizer approach. And for a category D aircraft to circle, you add an extra 180 feet and an extra mile and three quarters to do the circling procedure. This is due to the extra space required for that aircraft to fly the approach. Now let's look at a couple other instrument approach charts. This is the LDA runway 19 right at John Wayne Airport in Orange County. The chart has the same format with our categories at the top and our approach types along the side. In this case though, you'll see that the approach is divided into two sections. The top section has both the straight in and circling approach, and the bottom section is labeled Gower Fix Minimums, and has both the straight in and circling approach as well. What this indicates to you is there are two separate sets of minimums, depending on whether or not you can fix the Gower intersection. If you can fix that intersection, then you can come down lower on the approach. It's important to note if the approach that you're flying has separate minimums depending on what fixes you can receive, since often those minimums are significantly different. In this case, you can see that the ceiling requirement of 880 feet without Gower actually comes down to 480 feet if you can receive the Gower intersection. Since this is a non-precision approach, the visibility remains the same. Also, take note that on this chart, 
Runway visual range or RVR values are used all the way up to 4,000 or three quarters of a statute mile. Many charts will actually display a one half or three quarters. However, if RVR is normally used at the airport, you'll definitely see those values listed on the approach procedure. Now we're going to throw in a slightly different twist. This is the VOR runway 25 left or right into Las Vegas McCarran. This chart is a little bit different as you can find minimums for two different runways in the minima section. And the minimums are actually different. In this case, to 25 right, you need one mile of visibility. To 25 left, you only need three quarters of a mile of visibility. Make sure that when you're flying approaches like this, you are confident of the minimums for that runway. Finally, we're going to take a look at a GPS approach. Now, RNAV GPS approaches have many different categories of approach based on what your receiver is capable of receiving and also what is available in the area in terms of WAS or Wide Area Augmentation System, which enhances GPS accuracy. This chart happens to have all of the available minimums listed. There's an LPV approach, which is considered the most accurate GPS approach, includes a glide slope, and can be flown to altitudes that are almost always near an ILS precision. Next, you have LNAV VNAV, which also has a glide slope. However, it's treated much more like a non-precision approach. And as you can see, the ceiling requirement is just a little bit different on this one. On many approaches, though, the LNAV VNAV minimum will be much higher than the LPV minimum. Next, you have LNAV, which simply gives you lateral guidance. LNAV approaches are strictly non-precision approaches, and you can see that it has a much higher ceiling now of 720 feet. And now there's a category breakdown for categories C and D, which increases the visibility requirement to a mile and a quarter. When flying an RNAV approach, it's extremely important to note what kind of guidance your receiver is giving you. If it's not going to give you LPV guidance, you can't use the LPV minimums. If it's going to give you LNAV only guidance, you must use the LNAV minimums and cannot substitute any lower minimums on the chart. And that's it for the Instrument Approach Chart Minima section. Look forward to seeing you again in another KL Aviation lesson.